Dr. Gooden here again with lecture number two from chapter one of the Essentials for Strength Training and Conditioning textbook. Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the neuromuscular system regarding recruitment and specifically motor units. Okay, let's get into it. In the last lecture, we talked about the basic structure and function of muscle tissue. In this lecture, we want to tie in the nervous system. Okay, so the nervous system, the muscular system, together they make the neuromuscular system. Let's see how it works. Okay, so these slides are adapted from the NSCA, um, and they go along with the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning textbook by Drs. Hoff and Triplett. Okay, so here we have a diagram of the neuromuscular junction, as well as on the left side of the screen, the steps of activation for muscles. So first we see that an action potential travels down the axon of the alpha motor neuron. It then triggers the release of acetylcholine, which then travels across the synaptic cleft to the motor end plate, and this causes an action potential. And this action potential travels through the whole cell at the same time because of these T-tubules, these transverse tubules that run transversely through the muscle cell. And then we can see the sarcoplasmic reticulum that will release calcium so that it can bind to the troponin tropomyosin complex and cause muscle fiber contraction. Now this process doesn't happen in individual muscle fibers. Recall that the contractile unit of the cell is a sarcomere, but the neuromuscular unit is a motor unit. A motor unit consists of an alpha motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. And the size of a motor unit will dictate the amount of control or force production that a muscle can generate. Muscles that function with great precision have very few muscle fibers per alpha motor neuron. But muscles that require less precision may have several hundred. All right, so your muscles in your eyes or in your fingers, for instance, have very fine movement control and have very small motor units, whereas your quadriceps or your glutes or hamstrings, they have large motor units. And those larger muscles that require less precision, well, they tend to be stronger and they can develop more force because as one alpha motor neuron fires, it can create tension and force in a whole bunch of different hundreds of muscle fibers. And here in this diagram, we can see the motor neuron. It's myelinated with Schwann cells. And we see all of these neuromuscular junctions where it is innervating individual muscle fibers. Now, there's an important principle we have to talk about, and it's the all or none principle. The all or none principle states that either all muscle fibers of a motor unit contract or none of them contract. So if that alpha motor neuron sends a contractile signal to the muscle fibers, they will all contract together or none of them will contract at all. So currently there's no evidence that a motor neuron stimulus causes only some of the fibers to contract. And likewise, a stronger action potential cannot produce a stronger contraction. So because of the all or none principle, we know that either all fibers contract or none contract. And we know that when they do contract, you can't actually regulate the force of that contraction through the action potential of the alpha motor neuron. It's the same force every time. So how do we exhibit different amounts of force with our muscles? How do we grade the force output? Well, to understand that, first we have to understand what happens when a motor unit is stimulated. So if a motor unit is stimulated a single time with a single action potential, that is called a twitch, a single twitch. And it generates a little bit of force, but then that force dissipates. If you have a second twitch occurring before the first twitch is fully dissipated, then you call that the summation of two twitches. Now, if you have a continuous twitch that's fast enough so that it so that one twitch occurs before the first one is fully dissipated, before that force is dissipated, but not quite fast enough to continue rising in force, you call that 
unfused tetanus. And that's because you get this wave-like pattern in forced production. So we call that unfused because you can still sort of see the individual, individual twitches and you don't develop very much force. Now, if you have a rapid enough signal down that alpha motor neuron, then you get what's called fused tetanus and you can develop the full force capacity of that motor unit. So while each individual action potential cannot stimulate small subsets of the muscle fibers that it innervates and it cannot produce a stronger or a weaker um, twitch force, if we have a higher frequency of twitches, then we can actually produce more force in that muscle. Now, not every motor unit or muscle fiber are created the same. Each muscle fiber has, falls somewhere along the spectrum of slow to fast twitch. And we have three basic kinds. So type one fibers are slow twitch. And we can see their properties here in this column. As we look at them, notice that they are smaller. They have lower recruitment thresholds, meaning that they're easier to recruit. It's, um, it takes less uh, intensity or velocity or force of action to recruit these smaller motor units. They have slower nerve conduction velocity, slower contraction speed, et cetera, et cetera. They have high endurance and fatigue resistance. Okay, so these are your slow twitch fibers, your endurance fibers. But they have low force production, low power output, lots of aerobic enzymes, but very few anaerobic enzymes more capillary density, more myoglobin content, right? So they require oxygen in order to fun function. They can also run off of fat. They have high mitochondrial density. So you, you kind of get the picture, right? These slow twitch muscle fibers are great for endurance, not great for power, not great for force production. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have type 2X or fast twitch muscle fibers. And these are the opposite of the slow twitch. These are larger, they are um, they have a high recruitment threshold. They're very fast as far as nerve conduction velocity, contraction speed, relax relaxation speed, etc. But they don't really resist fatigue very well, and they don't have great endurance. They do, though, have high force production power output and anaerobic enzyme output. And then the type 2A fibers, these are the intermediate fiber types, and they're kind of right smack dab in the middle. Okay, so what does this mean in the real world? Well, if we put this in terms of athletics, we can think of your typical endurance distance athlete as having predominantly type 1 or slow twitch muscle fibers. Okay, so these are smaller motor units, easier to recruit, but they last for days and they keep going. Well, not literally for days, but they last for a long time and they allow these distance athletes to put out relatively high power outputs for the duration of their event. On the other end, we have the fast twitch, the purely fast twitch, and this would be uh, athletes like sprinters or throwers who are very fast and powerful but only for a short period of time with massively high average power outputs over their very short event that lasts maybe anywhere from one to ten seconds. And then in between you have the mix, okay? So these fiber types are a mix of qualities and these would be prevalent in say your 400 meter athletes or maybe in your decathletes or your and uh, some of your middle distance athletes and these athletes have to have a blend of endurance because maybe they're event lasts for more than 10 seconds, and also a blend of strength and power and force production capacity because they do have to have a high power output. So a key point here, motor units are composed of muscle fibers that have specific morphological and physiological characteristics. Morphological means like the shape and structure, physiological means the enzymes and uh, physiological components of the cell and these determine their functional capacity. Okay, so not all motor units are the same. There are small ones, big ones. There are fast twitch, slow twitch, and in between, and muscle fibers are the same. Fast twitch, slow twitch, and in between, somewhere on that spectrum is where they all fall. Now let's talk a little bit about um, rate coding and recruitment. So during exercise, you recruit motor units, and you don't recruit them all at once, Neither do you recruit them all for the entire time that you're exercising. In fact, the output of a muscle, the force output of a muscle can be varied through the change in frequency of activation of individual motor units or change in the number of activated motor units. Okay, so 
the two key words here are frequency of activation or number of activated motor units. Okay, so this picture here on the left, looking at recruitment and rate coding, this, I like this diagram because it shows five hypothetical motor units, and each of these lines, these uh, vertical lines, think of these as action potentials, and think of this line as time. Okay, so over time, we're recruiting more and more motor units. As time goes, we're recruiting more, and maybe as time goes, the force required by the muscle is getting higher and higher. Maybe you're trying to lift something and it's first developing tension, and so motor unit one is triggered. Maybe it has a lower threshold, okay? And then the rate coding starts to get faster and faster as time goes on, okay? But pretty soon you have to activate motor unit two to contribute, and then three, and then four, and then five, and so on up the chain, and maybe five has a highest recruitment threshold, and it's a larger motor unit. And as you go, you can see the rate coding is increasing, right? It's getting, sorry, my lines are kind of thick. It's getting faster and faster, okay? So it's modulating force, increasing force output by two methods. The first method is by recruiting more motor units, and the second method is by having faster action potentials. And so we can see in research conducted by Inoka et al. that looking at three different motor units, so the circle, triangle, and the dark circle uh, represented on this graph, these motor units have different discharge rates. And the faster the discharge rate, the faster the rate of force development. This is also abbreviated as RFD. Rate of force development is a more direct measure of explosive ability of a muscle. The faster you develop force, the more explosive you can be. And so these uh, motor unit, and so motor unit one, we can see, has a faster discharge rate, okay? So the discharge rate would be faster uh, if it is smaller, right? So that's faster. And it has a greater force production or greater rate of force production than the other two motor units. Okay, key point here is that the force output of a muscle can be varied through the change in frequency of activation of the individual motor units or a change in the number of activated motor units. And usually it's a combination of both. Now, another key point that we are about to get into, we, we're going to talk about proprioceptors. And these are specialized sensory receptors that provide the central nervous system with information needed to maintain muscle tone and perform complex coordinated movements. When I say muscle tone, I don't mean the, the sort of traditional lay term muscle tone, like you, you're getting toned, which actually means losing fat and gaining muscle size at the same time. What I, say, what I mean when I say muscle tone is the actual uh, resting tension in the muscle that is then modulated throughout uh, your body's movement. So the first proprioceptor to talk about are muscle spindles. Here we have a diagram of the muscle spindles, and you can see that it interfaces with sensory neurons that connect with the spinal cord. This is a cross section of the spinal cord. So when a muscle is stretched, the deformation of the muscle spindle, which is an intrafusal, intrafusal fiber, it's in the muscle belly, uh, the deformation of that muscle spindle activates a sensory neuron. Okay, so here's the sensory neuron sending signals back up to the spinal cord, which then synapses with the alpha motor neuron, sending a strengthened signal back down to the muscle to tell it to contract. So these muscle spindles are what activate your myotatic or stretch reflex. When activated, they tell your spinal cord to tell the muscle to contract. The reason why this feedback loop is important is because that signal doesn't have to come all the way from your brain. Uh, from the higher order centers of your central nervous system. It's a much faster signal. It's much more reactive. It's uh, reflexive. It's a reflex, right? And so this stretch reflex allows a body to react subconsciously and very quickly to external stimuli placed upon the muscles. And we'll see later how we can utilize the stretch reflex to our, exam to our advantage. <clears throat> the next proprioceptive organ to talk about is the Golgi tendon organ, or GTO. And these are located near the myotendinous junction in the muscle tendon. 
They occur in series, meaning they're attached end to end with the extrafusal fibers. And when they are activated, when extremely heavy loads are placed on the muscle, these GTOs are activated and they send a signal back to the spinal cord that actually inhibits, right? It blocks, you can see up here, it sort of blocks the alpha motor neuron and tells it to stop sending a signal to the muscle, okay? So if your muscle encounters a, a brief, sharp um, stretch or load that it can handle, it will activate the muscle spindles and cause a stretch reflex. But if the GTO is activated by a very, very strong muscle force, especially if it's sustained, it causes the muscle to actually relax. And it does so to prevent catastrophic damage to the muscle, right? Your body thinks better to just drop this weight than to try to hang on to it for dear life and risk you know, tearing the tendon at the insertion point or something like that. Okay, so with all of that together then, um, yes, that's really cool that we have motor units and that you can regulate force with action potentials or greater um, activation of more motor units and the proprioception of those muscle spindles and GTOs is neat, but how does that translate into training athletes? Well, athletes can imp improve force production through a number of ways. First, you can incorporate phases of training that use heavier loads in order to optimize neural recruitment. So heavier loads will activate those higher threshold motor units. It will cause the body to produce faster rate coding, right? And if you do that over and over again, then it will adapt to allow for greater rate coding. You'll be activating more, uh, more motor units synchronously, so all together at the same time. We can increase the cross-sectional area, or CSA, of muscles involved in the desired activity. So if we make those muscles bigger, now there are more contractile elements within the muscle to produce force. And then lastly, we can perform multi-muscle, multi-joint exercises. And these can be done explosively, and this will optimize fast twitch muscle recruitment, as well as the activation of the stretch shortening cycle, which we'll talk about in a future chapter, and it will rely on that stretch reflex if we have a reactive component, so that we can further activate that muscle through the reflexive properties of the muscle spindles and their activation of the alpha motor neuron. Okay guys, thanks for sticking with me through the overview of the neuromuscular system. The last couple of videos we've been zoomed way into the physiology of the mus muscular and the neuromuscular systems, but the next lecture we'll zoom out again and we'll look at the training principles, the guiding principles that we should always keep in mind when we're programming for athletes or training or setting up periodization schemes. And that video will appear somewhere on the screen. But if you had questions for this video, let me know down in the comments below. And until next time, move well, live well, and keep teaching other people to do the same.